Nicole Auerbach joins us now, and uh, I guess the biggest story of the weekend was, and the slate wasn't like tremendous or anything, to be fair, but Tennessee, Kentucky was supposed to be the big heavyweight bout, uh, and it was supposed to be Levis uh, and Hooker, and it was more Hooker than Levis, uh, and it was more Tennessee than Kentucky. What did we learn about Tennessee uh, defensively watching that game? Well, they look a lot better than yeah. we've seen them in, in, in some of the other games. I mean, certainly the Alabama game, they got a couple stops when they needed to, but everyone's kind of pointing to that pass defense as their weakness, but maybe they found some answers at corner. Um, I think, I think we still see that they can get after the quarterback. Like it, it's not, sometimes the, the total numbers don't quite tell the same story because like we've seen Tennessee's offense, you know, that their defense is out there for a lot of snaps too, because they're scoring so frequently, their drives are so short sometimes. Like, so, so when people say, Oh, they're, you know, last in total pass defense, like that number, the aggregate doesn't quite always tell, but they've definitely got some weaknesses there. And I think that's why like certain teams that have really good wideouts are probably going to be more of a problem for them. But um, yeah, they, they, they looked really good. I mean, they really shut Kentucky down. Their only score was in the first quarter and then it was done and they were just so dominant. I mean, I think that's what – like, Tennessee is checking off all the boxes of all the things that we keep asking to see from them to say, like, if they're really back. And blowing out a Kentucky team that entered the season, the highest it had been ranked in forever, that has built itself up as this kind of darling in the SEC East and this place that really develops and is consistent year in and year out and just totally flipping that on the head and being like, nope, we're here now. Um, I thought it was a pretty strong statement. But, yeah, they may have figured out some things defensively at the cornerback position. Well, it's got to be, like, frustrating if you're, if you're Kentucky because you go there, you're on the road, it's a big atmosphere, you, you go down 7 nothing or whatever it was, and you answer, and it feels like you had to earn that, that score. Like, it was like a normal, like, yeah. we earned it, we converted kind of score, and then Tennessee just makes it look easy the rest of the way. And it's obvious that you can't keep up with that offense unless you're firing at a really high click. And uh, I guess for Kentucky, it's got to be doubly like uh, you know disheartening because as a program, uh, you know you have a top ten pick at quarterback, or so that's the way people are talking about Levis, and you're still that much further away from the top of the SEC. I mean, like you, you know, this is your team. Like they they have been as good as they've been in recent memory. They built a really solid program. They have a they have the the. The, you know the the playmaker at quarterback, and they're still losing forty four to six or whatever it is. Uh, that's got to be tough for Kentucky. Are you high on Levis, or uh, you know, as a pro, or are you kind of like uh, relative to to the hype about him? Are you uh, above or below that hype? Probably a little bit below. Like I think this is going to be one of the more entertaining and also annoying pre draft processes. Like I yeah. feel like there's always those quarterbacks, right? And um, like I was really high on Josh Allen and I, I know why people weren't, but you know, I'd spent some time with him that year when he was struggling and had lost all these pieces at Wyoming. And so like, I had reasons that, you know, I was interested in that and also just rooting for a small school guy, like always going to be that person. But, uh, this one's going to be really interesting, especially because we're going to, he's going to be like the, the guy, everyone's going to talk about his heart and, you know, he's <laughs> toughness and, you know, he's just fearless and he's. You know, he goes into plays instead of sliding. You know, he'll just yeah. get tackled on all those different things, playing with that broken finger a couple weeks ago. Um, but, yeah, to me it says a little bit more about the, the quarterback from the draft class. But, like, this is a weird one that I don't know if anyone of us in college sports saw coming, that, like, all right. of a sudden we'd be talking about Will Levis as maybe the top quarterback drafted. So that one's – I'm a little bit lower than the hype, but happy to be proven wrong on this one. But this is one where it's just kind of a little bit out of the blue where the first time I saw a mock draft with it, I was like, okay. All right, I guess this is going to be fun. Is there a small uh, is there a small school guy this year? I mean, there's, there's obviously no Josh Allen, uh, but you you mentioned Wyoming. That's pretty cool. That you, did you go out and get to see Wyoming play that year in person? So I didn't I didn't go to see them play, but I did go to Laramie. I went yeah. and did a story with Colorado State and in Wyoming on that trip, and so it was like in the middle. Honestly, the story was really interesting because most people don't a pitch these types of stories, but like agree to do them and it was just sort of like okay he'd been anointed like that next great quarterback and then he comes into this his last year in college loses center top running back top receiver like everybody and then is losing these high profile games and everyone's out and it was just sort of like what happens when like the end of the fairy tale isn't that and it was just really I thought he was really introspective I thought it was really interesting 
Um, so I've always rooted for him. But in terms of small school guys, um, it's interesting because I, I feel like, you know, we saw Bailey Zappi do what he did last year and set all these records. And so you have a couple guys at places like Western Kentucky where you can sort of see that um, that type of explosiveness. But also like the guy that was behind Bailey Zappi, Cam Ward could be that yeah. guy, but he's transferred up. So he's at Wazoo now. So yeah. like you have some of that, but because of the quarterback movement, uh, sometimes they go to a little more high profile places. So That's uh, I'll get back yeah. to you though. I'll give you... I'll give you a list of those types of candidates. Well, it's funny because, like, I was just on, uh, you know, the the whole, what is this, uh, WalterFootball.com. I just kind of look at these lists, and I, I had to go down the list, like, 13 or 14 names, so I got to a small school guy this this coming year. I mean, most guys are coming out of larger schools, and, uh, you know, it's uh, I think the, the first kid I saw was the, the coastal kid, McCall. Yeah, which is, um, yeah, Grayson McCall, which yeah. is also, like, I think people thought, you know, the success that they had two years ago that he would have transferred out. Right. So that one's like a remarkable one where like he got all that attention. I'm sure he got a lot of phone calls, but decided to stay. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe he counts as our guy. For interesting. That. Interesting. Yeah. That's a really good point that with the transfer portal, we'll probably see less small uh, school guys popping up in the top 10 because they probably leave places like Laramie, um, which is a tough place to play. I always say that we got beat 23 to three in the opener my senior year up there in Laramie and that altitude is a beast and those cowboys and ranch hands they they're pretty good at college football yeah. they don't get enough credit <laughs> they um, are so so next week we're looking ahead to Georgia Tennessee which is going to be a monumental atmosphere uh in Athens um that's going to be crazy Georgia 10 point favorites is that too many points the way you look at it or i mean if you Nicole could make the line what would it be mm. Um, I mean, it does feel a little bit high. It feels like maybe seven would right. be right. But I also sort of get the deference to Georgia entering this game. I think it's going to be, it, it's essentially the SEC East championship, right? We actually have the SEC East and then the FCC West championships, like both being played next week. Um, so most likely the winners of those two games are the two that we'll see at the championship game. But I feel like Tennessee is going to have a chance here. I was talking with David Ubbin. He covered Tennessee for a number of years, now covers the whole SEC uh, for us at The Athletic. And he was just talking about how there are a couple teams that would be absolute nightmare matchups. Like, he thinks Ohio State would be a terrible matchup for Tennessee with right. where their weaknesses are defensively, right? right? And that they have an offense that could keep pace. He said Alabama and Georgia, the way that they're built, he doesn't think that – like that's part of the reason they were able to get Alabama this year. Right. And Georgia's defense isn't as good as it was last year. Plus, you know, you have those questions, you know, are they going to be able to score? I mean, yeah. Georgia is going to need to get to what? At least 30-something points in this game. Yep. Um, you're also going to need to, you know, wh where where can they take advantage? Obviously, they have an, an amazing tight end. Right. But are those receivers going to stress the Tennessee defense in the same way that in Ohio state would, we don't know. So I think seven feels about right to me, but I would not be shocked if Tennessee wins. Um, I am going to probably waffle back and forth on this one all week because I also tend to root for new blood, but it's sort yeah. of interesting because like, we're getting the college football playoff rankings on Tuesday before this game. And I think Tennessee I would put Tennessee one because I think the win over Alabama is the best win anyone has. Yep. But then you could also say the same thing about Georgia because the Oregon win looks better and better. So it's like it matters, but then the winner of that game will just be number one next week anyway. So it also doesn't matter. Yeah, no, it kind of matters. It kind of doesn't matter. And Georgia, my, my two cents is like that Oregon team, new coach traveling down there uh, to the southeast to open the season. Like that was always going to look bad. You know, it's just – you know, if you're going to lose that game, you're going to lose it by 30 points. It just was one of those tailor-made, wow, the SEC is good. It's September, and we already know how good the SEC mm -hmm. is. And like, So, I, I, you know, I, I do think they probably get uh, the benefit of, of that win. But uh, in actuality, um, I think this is going to be a really good football game. And if I was going to – if I had to bet it right now, I'd probably take Tennessee money line and, uh, you know, and juice that thing up and hope, uh, hope it's a, a barn burner down there. That's going to be awesome. Okay. So TCU, um, they're eight. No, they beat West Virginia, uh, 41, 31. If they're undefeated or how simple is it for them or how complicated is it for them? 
I think if they're undefeated and they win the Big 12, they're in. I mean, we haven't had an undefeated power conference champ not make the playoff. Yeah. What's going to be interesting is is where they fall in the first rankings because I, I, I am preemptively – I'm going to be mad about them. And I know that I'm going to tell myself these don't matter. These are – no one's resumes are done. The only one that matters is in December. But the first one is when we get to, like, see – a little bit about what the committee values or what they're prioritizing. Cause there's always new members and different things each, each year. We have a new chair this year, Boot Corrigan, NC State's AD. So like TCU has beaten a lot of teams that were ranked at the time. And there's some real, there's some good teams in, in the big 12. So how many of them are ultimately going to be in the committee's top 25? Right. Because then you're going to be able to say TCU has four top 25 wins or, or whatever that metric is. And then you could say that they're there, but also they've, had to come back from double digit down. Like the committee cares about the way you win the games too, right? And if you're in control of the games, uh, they have not been, but yeah. they've come back. And then like that offense is really special. So what is, what, like that? that's one of the teams that I'm going to be super interested to see what the committee says, because it'll show us, right? If they could even, if, if they could have one loss, yeah. would they still get in based on the way that the committee is viewing the league? So I think it's pretty clear, but We'll find out, probably we'll get a good idea of like if they have any wiggle room, which they might, they might, because we've also seen a lot of one loss conference champs get in. Yeah, so I look at this and I'm like, okay, Ohio State or Michigan, somebody's going to, I mean, maybe somebody's undefeated in the Big Ten champ. I mean, you, 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 Tennessee could go undefeated, they could win the SEC, they'd be in. You know, maybe, maybe, or, or maybe the other thing happens, Georgia goes undefeated and they end up in the SEC championship. And they lose to Bama, so there's two, you know, one loss uh, SEC powerhouses, and then there's Clemson. Clemson probably wins out, unfortunately, because they yeah. survived Syracuse. Like, uh, let's say a, 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 an undefeated Clemson um, and an undefeated TCU head to head. Does Syracuse's, uh, you know, uh, making that a fight? Does that stick in the committee's head right there? It it, it could. I, I think. You'll also have them talking, you know, they'll probably, we'll probably end up parsing, okay, they changed quarterbacks in that game, mm. but then we'll have to see how DJ plays after this, right? And then you say right. like, okay, which quarterback is going to be the guy they're going to play in the playoff? Mm-hmm. Um, I Again, I think, I think it would, it, between those two teams, depending on how the committee is justifying this, TCU's resume will probably be a lot stronger by the end of the season. If, if like, if we think that the top and the middle of the big 12 is, is good this year, ACC is not right. Yeah. There's a lot of teams fighting at the bottom. Um, so, so Clemson's not going to have that kind of resume. They have divisions this year, so they're going to have to play the Coastal Champ, who may or may not be ranked at the end in the conference championship game. So, I, I think TCU would have a better, better chance if Clemson goes undefeated, though. Like we 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 love to have all of these scenarios where we think that there's going to be like more teams undefeated than there actually are because like you just said a bunch of them are going to play each other right yeah. and so you'll at least have some head-to-head results um I, I mean Clemson would make it in that scenario I think if they go undefeated and, and win the ACC problem is I don't think anyone thinks they'll win a game in the playoff yeah. like I don't think anything I don't think anyone think, looks at Clemson playing this year and says that team could beat Ohio State right. that team could beat Georgia like it doesn't feel that way but can they get in can they get picked yes but We'll see. Again, I, I think I think it's very possible that the committee likes the Big Twelve teams and and ends up beefing up TCU's resume. But but we'll have to see. And and, and again, if Syracuse falls off or something and doesn't end up a top twenty five win by the end of the season, some of that stuff ends up impacting Clemson's resume. That's why you got to like root for all the teams to just beat. No question. Yeah, and and Michigan uh, say they they slide in. There's a lot of football left, but like. Your Wolverines, they get in, let's say, you know, do you feel better or worse about their chances of going toe-to-toe with an SEC uh, team uh, this year? Because it feels like a long time ago, but it's really not. That Georgia game was yeah. was ugly, yeah. and I'm wondering if you feel better this year. So it's actually really funny you asked that because that's the exact conversation one of my group chats was having this weekend was, like, okay, you know, going into these rankings, you, do you put Michigan there? And I think the answer is yes. And then the then the next question is, well, do you think they can actually win a game in the playoff? And I, th- I still think the answer is probably no, because we saw what it took to, to get to the top of the Big Ten and to beat Ohio State. Yeah. But there's still a different gap and things that you need to do if you're going to play like a Tennessee 
in the in the in the playoff and actually have a chance like we this is something that watching the Michigan Michigan State game was super apparent again like we saw them settling for all those field goals they're really hesitant to stretch the field vertically like they're not really trying much with JJ McCarthy and he's only completed very few passes in Big Ten play that are more than 20 air yards so he's he's not doing it that well but they're also not trying like entering Saturday he'd only attempted 16 passes that were deep balls so in Big Ten play so they're gonna have to add that element because like you can't just dominate with the run game and try to win in the trenches and that's not gonna get you enough points against right. Tennessee like that I think watching the game Saturday you know they're dominating they clearly did not have much respect for Michigan State's offense because right. they were fine with the field goals Harbaugh would have been fine winning that game without the touchdown but <laughs> The question is then, like, can you beat Ohio State, this Ohio right. State team this year without without that? And then what about in the playoff? And so I think they need to continue to develop that. And until they do that, I mean, it's hard to imagine, especially if you think of Tennessee. Like, I think that – that I'm thinking of Tennessee as, like, the prototypical type of playoff team. The SEC speed, the, the skill at all of the different offensive skill positions, the quarterback, but just the idea that you'd need – at least 30 points, right? Yeah. And and maybe they're going to get 50 on someone, right? We, yeah. we, you know, we've seen Alabama have to adapt to winning games like that post Lane Kiffin, right? And all the changes that they made. So can Michigan do that? Like they like winning the games the way that they are now, but that's the gap. And that was the difference with Georgia. So I, I would still say no until they prove it that they can win those games and that they can stretch the field and do different things offensively to stay in the game. But like they, they have talent. They have talent. Um, it's just like you saw the gap that existed between really good in the Big Ten and winning a game in the playoff. And we've also seen a number of other teams that couldn't figure that out, right? Like those Lincoln Riley Oklahoma teams never won a game in the playoff. Right. They could get there. Right. Michigan can get there. Um, but yeah, so I guess until someone proves it, I'm just I'm just not sure. Cause you know, it's just it feels like there's certain programs that we've seen do it over and over and over again. And then there was the one flash in the pan of LSU in that season. Right. But other than that, you know, these other teams that have kind of gotten there have not been able to then break through that next that next gap. Well, I'm I'm hopeful that this is the playoff. We have some close ball games. I'm hopeful that that, uh, you know, we buck the trends uh, yeah. and, and we have some one score games yeah. in, in each round. And uh, I do like that you're you're um, you're managing your expectations, Nicole. So uh, hats off to you for doing that. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens the rest of the way. Um, Nicole Auerbach, appreciate the time uh, next weekend. A lot of big games as well. We will see you. Uh, we'll see you next Monday. All right, I am hopeful that Virginia scores touchdowns for you at <laughs> Gee, some point the rest of the I had to season. listen to that damn thing on the radio. I, I, I was in my car <laughs> during overtime. I had to drive somewhere, oh, no. and uh, and it was rough. I mean, like, I listened to that loss the old-fashioned way. So, uh, But then I, I got home and, and watched Louisville turn or force five turnovers against Wake Forest. So I don't know who had a worse day, Sam Hartman or, or Brennan Armstrong. I, I just put that one out there for people, so. Yeah, I felt I felt so bad for Sam Hartman in that third Jeez. quarter. I I just never seen something like that because they got they had so many possessions, so he just kept turning he just it over. Kept I just, turning it over. Oh, oh god, oh. I felt terrible. But yeah, that was it was a banner day for the ACC. I'm praying for the ACC, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> better week next week. Yeah, I appreciate you, and we will see you next week. All right, see you soon. Listen to the full podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast streaming platforms. Uh, wherever you want to get the podcast, you can get the podcast. Pretty simple. New episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Podcasts get pretty wild. This is real tame.